So wildfires have gotten increasingly severe over the past couple of decades. Since the 1950s, wildfires have occurred five times more frequently and are on average 10 times larger. And climate scientists predict things are going to get even worse. The Green New Deal seeks to mitigate climate change that will cause, quote, wildfires that by 2050 will annually burn at least twice as much forest area in the western United States than was typically burned by wildfires in the years preceding 2019. Well, that sounds like bad news. Surely there should be less wildfire than that. But how much less wildfire should there be? And how exactly should wildfires be reduced? I'm actually really excited that concern over wildfire has motivated a lot of people to be more concerned about climate change. But sometimes I'm worried that concern over climate change will transition into calls to halt wildfire itself. Now, you can reduce wildfire by reducing conditions that are favorable to burning, like slowing climate change or doing prescribed burns. Or you can actively suppress fires, and historically we've really leaned into one of those. It was fire suppression. <laughs> One thing that I think is really interesting about wildfire is there's not really a good baseline for comparison over the past century. I left off last video when the country was facing its worst wildfire seasons in history, and for reasons that I'll get into in this video, we really shouldn't view the historically low levels of wildfire in the 20th century as a norm that we should return to. The only truly sustainable model of management that we have is indigenous management, and so I've tried to weave that in and out of our discussions of fire history. Okay, so let's get into it. I left off my last video in 1910, which was the country's worst wildfire season ever, the Big Blow-Up. And the Big Blow-Up was crazy. It burned over 3 million acres in the Northern Rockies. The Big Blow-Up is what really launched wildfire management into the national discourse, as it became apparent that, you know, the, the little baby five-year-old Forest Service really didn't have the capability to combat the threat of wildfire. Fire discourse also really rode a wave of progressive sentiment in the early 20th century. Railroad tech bros were coming under increased scrutiny in antitrust cases, and growing alarm at the increased rate of deforestation really bolstered public conservation sentiment. Basically, the big blow-up buttressed a lot of progressive conservation efforts and gave a lot more funding to the Forest Service. The Weeks Act was passed only a year after the big blow-up and authorized the Forest Service to spend a lot more money on bringing land into the national forest system. The Forest Service was able to acquire 6 million acres just from the Weeks Act provision and incorporated those lands into a new system of fire management. So a whole bunch of great national forests just came out of the Weeks Act, and I put a link in the description that lists all of the Weeks Act forests. Weeks Act forests. Go, go nuts. Go check that out if you want. So astute viewers might say, but last time you said that the, the United, United States, States bought up a ton of land in the West and wanted to shift as much, much of that, of that land, land into private ownership, ownership as possible. So doesn't this completely go against this policy? And it does. That's why we're talking about obscure 20th century legislation. The Weeks Act is really cool because it's one of the first pieces of legislation that really starts to reverse the position that public land should be moved into private ownership. Instead, public ownership was now being promoted as an effective way to move natural land into a protective status. So in the years after the big blow up and some really other awful wildfire seasons in the 1920s, the Forest Service really starts to come into its own as a really effective force to fight wildfire and also took a really hard line stance against wildfire. In 1935, this was articulated as the 10 a.m. policy. Now the 10 a.m. policy mandated that all fires be put out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And the idea is really intuitive. The idea is that a fire is gonna be less expensive and easier to put out the earlier that it's caught. But this really didn't take into account forest types like pond Rosso, where a lot of flammable litter builds up if it's not burned, and it really didn't take into account just how much fuel would build up over a couple decades of the policy. Now, I realize that this video might come across as anti-forest service, and I want to say that's really not my intention here. I think it's really easy to look at policies like fire suppression and say like, oh, look at those silly billies, that's a funny way of managing the forests. But the country was grappling with the worst wildfire seasons and really like some of the worst natural disasters the country has ever seen. So people were very reasonably concerned. I mean, if I lived in the other 20s, I'd say, yeah, politicians, take responsibility for your forests, do something. In the years after 1935, the U.S. Forest Service became especially efficient in enforcing the 10 a.m. policy. And when you think about it, that's really incredible. They were handed the worst wildfire seasons in U.S. history and became so good at firefighting that we reached historically low levels in the 40s through the 60s. And firefighting had a really strong moral force behind it. You get to be unequivocally good fighting against a force of evil. Gary Snyder, a poet who was a firefighter in the 1950s, wrote, Look. When I do this kind of work, I can really say I'm doing no harm in the world, and I'm only doing good. 
This moral stance was also reflected in Forest Service ad campaigns. Although there are some ad campaigns from the 30s, advertisement became especially important for the Forest Service during World War II, when a lot of firefighters went overseas to join the war effort. A common thread through all of these is to position wildfire as a public responsibility. If there's a fire in your area, it's more than likely someone's fault. Additionally, that fault doesn't just come from some action, but rather, that is a moral defect. This is especially apparent in this poster from the 30s, which bolds the qualities of carelessness, maliciousness, and negligence, and just lists the tangible actions causing wildfire as subtitles. Fire prevention in the mid-20th century also isn't just framed as an economic concern, but an ecological one. You see this a lot when Smokey the Bear is introduced in 1944, but there were also ads with these super cute woodland creatures pleading me to be careful. Oh jeez, I didn't even start a forest fire, but now I feel guilty! The original Smokey the Bear was an orphaned bear cub rescued from a fire in New Mexico. The short film Little Smokey from 1953 gives Smokey's full backstory and emphasizes how really good things were before the fire. That's right. That bear cub didn't have a care in the world. And somebody, a two-legged somebody, got careless. It also has this, like, really incredible score that makes the fire sound absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Uh, you should watch the whole thing, it's great. So firefighters were these really glorious chads, and this moral force helped to unite the public and the agency itself. Heck, Hadwell and Cassidy will even bring you oranges if you help prevent wildfires. He sure liked the oranges I brought him, but I'd do that for any forest fire preventing pal. At the time, the 10 a.m. policy was a really popular decision and earned the Forest Service an immense amount of public goodwill. It also made the Forest Service really good at applying agency-wide policy. But as we'll see, that agency-wide policy could have been a little more nuanced. I hate forest fires worse than all the diamondback rattlesnakes in the world. So we have the Weeks Act, and we have a lot of good feelings, but fires don't care about your feelings. It amazes me that the Forest Service and the National Guard were able to put out the big blow up so quickly, because they had really limited firefighting technology. Heck, it'd be like going to the moon with slide rules. The Pulaski wasn't even called the Pulaski during the big blow up, because Ed Pulaski was fighting in the big blow up. So technology development and ecological research became top priorities for the Forest Service. The Forest Service manufactured a lot of their own tools at first, but a lot more firefighting equipment was supplied after the New Deal, and we get really cool firefighting equipment after World War II, like planes and trucks. This led to some crazy pop sci like fad level soldier firefighter crossover articles, like this one from Popular Mechanics titled Water Bombs for Forest Fires. Again, fires are the enemy, so I guess you just gotta bomb the shit out of them. Now, not everyone was on board with fire suppression or the 10 a.m. policy. Another thing that I think is really cool about wildfire history is that the pro-fire camp really brings together unlikely coalitions, and not everyone in that group is ecologically motivated. On the one hand, there were pockets of resistance within the Forest Service. Lots of foresters, especially in Florida, recognized the historic importance of fire on the landscape and wanted to maintain the health of their forests. Tribal forestry departments are also generally more pro-fire. In my last video, I talked about the impact of indigenous burning in North America, and a lot of tribes have traditional burning practices. The Karuk Nation, for instance, continues to do incredible advocacy work for returning indigenous burning to the landscape. So understandably, a lot of tribes were really annoyed that traditional burning was, you know, yet another piece of their culture that the federal government was disallowing. On the other hand, you have farmers and ranchers who want to use fire to clear land for agriculture and pasture. Pasture. I don't deny that farmers genuinely care for the well-being of their land, but the goal of clearing land for agriculture doesn't have an inherent ecological commitment to it. And I think this leads to one of the key questions about wildfire in the 20th century. Should fire be controlled exclusively by the state? I would argue that yes, because you need some system in place to prevent bad actors from clearing vast swaths of forest. But what do you do when the state's wildfire policy is misinformed? On the one hand, you could give more credit to folk burning practices. You could actually take the generations upon generations of indigenous management seriously. Or you could trust that the family farmer knows what's best for his land. I personally don't think those two are equivalent, so a modern solution needs to disambiguate between settler and indigenous practices, but I really don't trust a 1930s politician to do so. So I think the question politicians then would have asked would be, should we trust folk burning practices either? Folk management practices can be great, but they also gave us things like the Dust Bowl. So 
I don't know, do you advocate for better scientific research? But what do you do when the state actively suppresses pro-fire papers? I have a couple of thoughts about potential solutions, but what actually ended up happening is that private research was the first to demonstrate that fire is a really necessary component of the landscape. In the 1920s, some Florida men were concerned about declining quail populations. In 1924, Herbert Stoddard surveyed those tasty, feathery orbs that was then the Tall Timbers Plantation in central Florida. The findings were published as the Cooperative Quail Investigation. What they found out was that mosaic habitats in the 1800s, where meadows were interspersed with fire stands, supported healthier quail populations than where forest stands closed in during fire suppression. The Cooperative Quail Investigation was a departure from Forest Service research because it didn't assume that fire was bad from the get-go. Instead, it really looked at how fire alters species composition. This kind of line of questioning eventually grew into the field of fire ecology. The Cooperative Quail Investigation was a hugely important jumping-off point, and almost all early fire ecology research was conducted at the Tall Timbers Plantation and, after 1958, the Tall Timbers Research Station. They self-published almost all their research and declined the peer review process, which was notoriously unfriendly to pro-fire research at the time. So I do also want to disclaim, private enterprise taking over scientific research is not a solution that should be generalized, especially when it comes to ecology. One of the reasons why Tall Timbers worked out is that they didn't really have a conflict of interest about fire. About quail, sure. Yes, the original quail study had an agenda, but it was more of a pro-quail agenda than a pro-fire agenda. So I guess I wouldn't trust a study coming out of there that was like, are quail good for the landscape, you know? Well, yes, quail are the most important species there is. Instead, I think that the history of forestry as a science is a really interesting cautionary tale about how the peer review process can become overly dogmatic. I think it's important to ask ourselves, why did agencies hold on to the demonization of wildfires so much, even when good science was saying otherwise? And are any of those biases clouding our own viewpoints? So there are a number of non-quail related things that can happen as a result of fire suppression, and I wanted to highlight the main ones. First, wildfire clears out a lot of available fuel, so without it, fuels can build up. And this is more of a problem in some ecosystems than others. For example, leaf litter in deciduous eastern forests usually isn't a huge hazard because the area in general is just more humid. Second, in addition to there just being more fuel available for wildfires, fuels are also more continuous if fires are suppressed. This is a photo from the Mission Mountain Range from around 1920, before fire suppression was enforced, and you can see a lot of the bald patches that have burned recently have a lot less fuel. So when a new fire comes through, it has a lot less to burn in these patches. Even if the fire still burns, it's going to be less intense. And third, species composition can change, and different species will have different fire behaviors. So some species, like ponderosa pine and dug fir, produce litter that is conducive to less intense, surface-level fires, while other species, like Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir, are conducive to explosive, stand-replacing fires. And a lot of the times, tree species that grow immediately after a wildfire burn less intensely than those that start growing long after a fire. Now, none of these factors in itself is a bad thing. Understory vegetation is good, and we need Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir to support other cool ecosystems, but fire suppression exacerbates all of these factors at once, and in the mid-century, exacerbates them at a continental scale. So people are talking about fire ecology, but what's the praxis? Around the same time as the founding of the Tall Timbers Research Station, the National Park Service started noticing some trouble within the parks. And a seemingly unrelated issue actually initiated policy changes to return fires to the landscape. People like charismatic megafauna like elk, bison, or my personal favorite, the American antelope. Look at these boys! They're so fast! Antelope are the fastest terrestrial land mammal in North America. They can run up to 60 miles per hour, but why? Why, you might say, why can they run that fast? Mammologists' leading theory is that they evolved to run that fast to outrun saber-toothed tigers. So if people say, let's go to Africa to see the antelope, you can say, we've got antelope at home. Or you're in Africa, you can, also, you can also say that. African antelopes get the recognition that they deserve. So in order to appease visitors, Yellowstone National Park encouraged more friendly megafauna into the park while killing off predators. As a result, elk populations had exploded and they were eating the park raw. They had eaten up a lot of the forest and populations were becoming unhealthy. The agency commissioned A. Starker Leopold, the son of Aldo Leopold, to study why were elk not doing so well. Fun fact, well, not, not really fun, but, you know, fact, 
Aldo Leopold died fighting a wildfire. Starker Leopold's findings were published in 1963 in what became known as the Leopold Report. The Leopold Report is cool because it represents a huge departure in how the National Park Service thought about wildfire. You know, instead of painting wildfire as unnecessary destruction or, in Gifford Pinchot's words, a dragon devastation, he really portrayed wildfire as something that's necessary to the natural ecology. One of the things that I really like about the Leopold Report is that he draws a really sharp distinction between parks management since the park's founding and what his vision and recommendation for the park service is going forward. Specifically, he cites an attitude of protection dominating conservation discourse in the early days of the park service. Quote, the park service were established as refuges. The animal populations were protected from wildfire. For a time, predators were controlled to protect the good animals from the bad ones. Now, this isn't all bad. In fact, one of the advantages of protection as a management strategy is that it's really, really good at conserving climax communities. And the Leopold Report acknowledges this. Protection may be exactly what is needed to maintain such climax associations as Arctic alpine health, the rainforests of the Olympic Peninsula, or the Joshua trees and saguaros of the southwestern deserts. On the other hand, grasslands, savannas, aspen, and other successional shrub and tree associations may call for very different treatment. And that different treatment is fire. Specifically, removing the understory vegetation that had built up during fire suppression. If you have time, I actually really highly recommend just reading the full report. Like, it's only 14 pages long and the text is super fun and accessible. I mean, I could sit here for like the next 20 minutes just throwing more Leopold report quotes at you. A. Starker Leopold is really embedded within this anti-fire academic climate, and I think it's really cool to see such an influential pushback of his contemporaries. So at the Leopold Report's behest, the National Park Service slowly became more open to having fire on the landscape. In 1968, the National Park Service formally acknowledged fire as a natural process. But then they're faced with a question. How exactly do you return fire to the landscape? In a lot of areas still today, understory vegetation is built up so that prescribed burns can't really be lit safely. This, this issue is actually also articulated in the Leopold Report. This is the last time I'm going to quote the Leopold Report, but it actually is really well articulated. Unfortunately, however, forest and chaparral areas that have been completely protected from fire for long periods may require careful advanced treatment before even the first experimental blaze is set. The second problem is, how do you return wildfire to the landscape in a publicly agreeable way? How do you convince a population that's been told since birth that only you can prevent forest fires, that forest fires are the result of negligence and shame, that fires are actually a natural process and sometimes necessary? The Park Service change in orientation toward wildfire also coincided with the Mission 66 program, which invested over a billion dollars in parks infrastructure. Which is great, you know, but what do you do when parks visitors won't recognize when a patch of vegetation is overgrown, but will get upset if a national park burns? I think I'm actually going to leave it there for now, but oh boy, those are some management questions. These things are hard, and these questions aren't going to get resolved in the next video because this tension of maintaining healthy fire regimes and, you know, not letting people's houses burn down is just a really really difficult problem and foresters are still navigating it. But in the next video, and oh my goodness, I promise that this is going to be the last fire history video for a little bit and then we'll move on to something else. Um, in the next video, I'm going to talk about how wildfire was actually reintroduced to the landscape and how the public's been grappling with that. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Um, if you like this, uh, please like, comment, subscribe. Um, I am the sleepiest grebe. Um, I make videos about conservation history, ecology, um, environmental philosophy, that kind of stuff. And I hope to see you again next time. Have a great day.